What up, what up, what up? <laughs> that, was the, that was the worst thing I could have possibly done. Sorry. I'm sorry, everyone. Hi. Hey, Morgan. It's good to see you. Thanks for dropping in. Hey, Kelly. Hey, ED. Hey, Mark. I think Ma's watching, too. So tonight, um, I have a ton of stuff I have to get done this weekend. So um, I wanted to do a very low effort uh, live stream. And I thought something fun to look at would be uh, my famous artist cartoon courses. Um, these are some of the best like um, how to comic book resources. And unfortunately, I don't think they're in print, and I doubt they'll ever be back in print. They just have, like, way too much copyrighted stuff in them for them to be. Um, to straighten that all out again would be rough. Um, but look, check these out. So they actually come in a set of three binders. And they are so gorgeous. And they're bigger than a normal binder. Like a normal binder. Like for an eight and a half by 11. It's like that big. So these things are huge. And the, so the idea with this thing was that it was um, uh, a correspondence course. So you would like, you know, send in $14 or something, and then they would send you the binder and the first couple lessons. And then every month or every, like every time you finished a lesson, they would, you would mail in the drawings that you did. And it would, they would have someone uh, go through and like do the grade, like look at it and give you a grade and give you some tips and send it back to you with notes. And uh, yeah, so, and this is all has lessons that were written by all these guys. Like here's Rube Goldberg, um, that guy, <laughs> uh, Al Cap, Milton Kniff. stuff is so cool and it has like all these great lessons so by the way you can pick these up on um on ebay um, pretty regularly i got i think i got mine from um a bookstore but i can't remember because I, no i didn't i ordered these from ebay and I think I paid about a hundred bucks a piece for, or I think I paid 150 for the whole set, something like that. And it's not quite complete. There's a couple lessons that are missing out of here. Like, I don't think I have like two and three and four maybe because I went online. Oh, by the way, you can find these online a bunch of places. So I found the missing pages that I, online and printed them out for myself. So it has like all these great, and you know, it's one of those things where it's like a lot of the industry ideas behind, like it'll tell you like how to get a job and like, None of that would work nowadays. But the cartooning techniques in it are all solid. <laughs> it's like, you can draw envelopes. Oh, if only.
And this is pretty amazing, actually. This is like they got all these dudes in one place to look, you know, pretend like they're grading people's artwork. Or no, it says that they're <laughs> they're enjoying their own contributions to the famous artist cartoon course. That's the X is this guy holding a bunch of puppies. It says Penny. Who's Penny? Oh, Harry. Heineken's? It's funny, like I'm ruining my artist cred, my cartoonist cred by not actually knowing who all these people are, but the guy I'm most excited about are the Milton Kniff pages. This dude, this is back when like, like this dude, just from doing comic strips, like newspaper strips was friggin' rich. Those are the days. Same with Al Cap. Like this dude, and Al Cap was kind of a dick, but um, being in a syndicated newspaper strip back then was like cash money. That's like, I mean, it's still, I think you can still make a pretty good living doing it. I don't even think about that Dilbert dude. I think he threw away millions of dollars just by being a racist douche, douche bag. Oh, this is the Harry. Um, I don't know how to pronounce that last name. He did a really great um, cartoon strip. I can't remember what it's called. Oh, Penny. Um, about uh, teenagers back in the 40s and 50s, maybe 50s and 60s, when teenagers were still a new idea. Here's your good old, <laughs> this is like, this is an indicator of like the time period. Here's your, um, your morgue. What are they? What's, there's another name for that. Um, oh, your swipe files is the other name for this. So this is when you're, you're supposed to go through like just all the magazines you read and clip out pictures of everything. So if you see a picture of like a, like a gorilla, you clip it out, and then when you need to know what a gorilla looks like to draw it, you can go to your swipe file and go to the G's, pull out the, your gorilla pictures. Pre-internet. And I'm right at that age where I actually kind of started working on my own um, swipe file um, when I was very young in my early twenties, but then the internet got good enough that, um, I abandoned it, but I knew a lot of other artists, um, who had pretty extensive, uh, swipe files to work from like guys that are a little bit older than me. And nothing really changes about the materials, man. Pencil, pens, brushes. I guess the only thing is uh, I wouldn't ever use this uh, fixative if I didn't have to. It is not what you call um, archival.
Yeah, I guess that pencil sharpener is a little bit um, obsolete. I haven't used an electric or a hand crank pencil sharpener in decades. I even use an electric eraser most of the time. So there's some really great stuff. Like if you didn't know anything about cartooning, like here's um, a Milton Kniff strip. I think this is intended to show it as actually like the actual size of the artwork, which, you know, what is this? Six inches. Seven inches tall. And then it's reproduced at this height. Two and a half inches, which man, working this big, like that'd be so fun. I wish, like, I wish I had the patience to actually work that big. The um, the reason I like I usually work at eleven by seventeen just so that um, I can scan in one go. Because the last thing I want to do is sit around and scan. Um, no, my, well, no, it does. This doesn't, um, my electric eraser does not mess up my watercolor paper, but also I don't really use real watercolor paper. I use that, uh, Strathmore mixed media, uh, paper, the series 400 stuff, um, which is a lot more like Bristol board. Um, but it's like if Bristol board was like super awesome. But I have used that on watercolor paper without like um, a lot of bad stuff happening to it. I feel like this stuff is pretty standard. Like if you've ever had those like how to draw 20 dinosaurs or whatever books, like it kind of goes over a lot of this exact same kind of construction. Maybe that's not the book I'm thinking of, but it feels like I've had, I've seen a million like how to cartoon books that go over these same construction principles, especially like these where you draw different shapes and then turn them into faces just like squeezing a balloon so this is like this is how this stuff is so cool so this is the sheet that tells you so you we just read through all our stuff and here's our assignment on a piece of eight and a half by 11 inch bond typewriter paper draw in pencil three men's heads about two inches high Draw one each of the following views. Front view, three-quarter side view, front view looking down. Vary the expressions to suit yourself. It's like good stuff if you're like a beginner. Like this is how, how you would start. Yeah, Jack Ham's How to Draw the Head and Face. That sounds familiar. Yeah, so I mean, I think the idea of doing a correspondence course back in the, what's the copyright on this? Like, I think this was the 50s or 60s when these were out. Um, 
I don't know. It's just so fun. Like just imagining somebody on their like sitting in their tiny town in like somewhere in the Midwest with big dreams of being a cartoonist and sending away for this and then sitting at their kitchen table and doing all the assignments. It's really fun. And this one even, this set was owned by Mimi McCurley Dodds. I wonder how far along Mimi got. Yeah, and this was like a big enough operation. You can see like the address is just Famous Artist Cartoon Course, Westport, Connecticut. You didn't even need like a street address. That's so rad. Hey, Pippi Pop. Yeah, I love these books. I think these, like I was saying earlier, I think these are some of the best like books on cartooning. Like there's actually, where's the one? Yeah, <laughs> I open it right to it because I look at this one a lot. So this is chapter nine about clothing, clothing and folds. And this has some of the like best um, just reference stuff for how fabric folds I've ever seen. And this is very cute where all the different artists drew the same little hillbilly character. So some basic principles. But then like these pages are actually like so well explained and so like just nicely like broken down and made clear. Like you can just like this is very it was very helpful to me seeing just like thinking about how the fabric, like what point of the body the fabric hangs from and how they crunch up. Like how this fabric crunches up when you move around in different ways. That's great. And more of this stuff here. Like if you look at my my pages, um, a lot of this, like the way I draw clo clothing folding is like totally just taken from from these from these lessons. So good. Like that little God, like that little fold on the front of the skirt is so like I would not have thought of that, but once you see it, you're like, oh yeah, that looks right. Yeah, this is fun. So this was the assignment one for this chapter where you took these figures and you would draw the clothing on them with the appropriate folds. So good. I wonder about some of this. So like um, Frank Frazetta was drawing um, Lil Abner for a long time. I think there was a bunch of different artists who were drawing Little Abner. So I wonder who actually drew this for the famous artist cartoon course. Because it's pretty likely that Al Cap did not draw any of this.
Yeah, Frazetta drew little Abner. He did that for he did that for a long time. It was sort of before um, he got famous for his uh, book covers. Yeah, like um, there was some interview I was reading with Frazetta talking about his time drawing little Abner, and um, he seemed pretty, he seemed pretty. Um, uh, like uh resentful of al cap because al cap never admitted to other people drawing his strips he always sort of claimed credit for him no matter what hey thanks stacy thanks for dropping by And these are beautiful. Like, I love seeing these um, Milton Kniff panels just in isolation like that. They're just beautiful compositions. Yeah, man, Milton Kniff is one of my favorite cartoonists of all times. Like... His work is just so, like, uh, seeing his stuff is actually why I started inking with a brush. Between him and Paul Pope, uh, they both sort of were, like, the influence that got me thinking about inking with a brush. <laughs> you guys, in case you didn't know, this is what a forceful female looks like. Yep. <laughs> it totally tracks. <laughs> And the old hotel dick, yep, also tracks. I do love this federal man. <laughs> Looks and acts like a businessman, it says. I don't, I don't know if that's exactly what a businessman looks like. Could be wrong, though. Yeah, it's just like, God, it's one of those things where it's the uh, there's just so many beautiful little drawings in these in these folders, and the fact that they come as folders too is like so satisfying, as opposed to um, you know coming in a book. Although I will say that they should, if they could ever straighten out all the copyright issues, they should. Um, reprint these as a book for sure <laughs> yeah no what kind of business are you in when you need that trench coat and this is like an indication of how old these are it's like you can see where the little dude was covering it and it's just it's not even it's like dust but it's like permeating the paper. And they have some great stuff about just staging and thinking about um, how to get the ideas across clearly. Wow. <laughs> 
like this is this is actually pretty great like this is something I am definitely guilty of not thinking not thinking through enough or it's like if your two characters are different heights getting them to be getting their feet on the ground when they're not in the pan when their feet aren't in the panel and this is legit like Milton Kniff did this a lot on his original art where he drew well past the the panel and it's always funny to me that he did that because it's like he did render them like I could totally see like drawing the silhouette of the arm and then just like working on the folds inside the panel but I wouldn't worry about like the shading outside the panel yes and this too like one of the greatest sins is crossing the streams Ugh. And that's a good solution for it right there. Ah, uh, but that is like a better solution. Yeah, I love seeing the lettering stuff, too. Um, that's... Uh, man, I, I wish, like, lettering was considered more important in, like, all of the comics industry nowadays. It is definitely all too often treated as an afterthought. And especially now that everyone works digitally, I feel like um, it would be where a page gets inked. These penny strips are pretty fun. Like I absolutely love this father character with his like bug eyes. Like Like that's such a great father being like what the hell is my teenager doing? Face Yeah, Morgan, God bless little, little, and <laughs> God bless all the letterers out there. They get, they 100% get the short end of the stick too, because letterers and colorists get shoved out to the very end of the production line. And so like any, like all of the deadlines end up actually like being very cruel to the letterers and colorists out there. <laughs> yeah mark totally but your your metaphor of a train track like sinking up to this drawing was like i was like what is mark talking about i 
That's some good perspective, though. Some good old one-point perspective. Man, it's hard to, like, even quantify how much, like, Clip Studio Paint's uh, perspective tools have made all of this stuff so much easier and faster. Yeah, Pippi, I could, like, there's definitely times when I just sort of end up having these out on my, on my desk and flip through them without really even rereading them or anything, just soaking it in. God, just look at this inking. on this like it's just so beautiful <laughs> and this is kind of funny too. Like, they call this, if I can get it into the view of the camera, they say, here's a photo of a power mower straight from the morgue. So, from their uh, swipe file. But it's just like, I guess it's possible that that was a photograph, but it is so heavily airbrushed that it barely even looks like a, a photo anymore. It looks way more like a painting. But that's a lovely little drawing of it. Man, one thing, this is sort of my own personal um, hill to die on, but I always wish that instead of calling them backgrounds, they would call them settings or environments. I feel like when you call this stuff backgrounds, you're um, minimizing its importance because it isn't just stuff that's in the background. It's like when you're drawing all of this sort of stuff, like depending on the kind of story you're telling, um, like this stuff is really important. It's as important as like your character designs easily. And drawing environments is fun. Drawing backgrounds doesn't sound that fun. And if you call it the setting, then it makes more sense that it's uh, critical to the storytelling. This is, <laughs> this is really good too. I remember um, talking to a programmer friend of mine about, um, we were working on a video game together and we had uh, some dog characters. And I was explaining how dogs walk on their tiptoes. Like we, how, you know, dogs and, and humans have the same bone structure. 
and in this example, horses and cats too. But I was just explaining how the, their heel is up high and um, it freaked him out. He thought that was the grossest thing ever, which is pretty great. <laughs> no, ED. Oh, yeah, drawing backgrounds is. Drawing, um, drawing backgrounds does feel like going to the dentist. But drawing your setting or drawing your environments, that's a delight. God, and these like really simple animal drawings are just all oh, just gorgeous. Like drawing a horse is hard enough, but drawing a horse eating shit like this guy. Like that's amazing. Yeah, there's so much information. Like this is somebody who is like understands the structure of these animals very well. Oh, look at this elephant. So few lines, but it just is so perfect. <laughs> and actually, this like shitty drawing of an elephant is like wonderful too. <laughs> oh, Kelly, I'm sorry. That sounds rough. Man, I need to go. I need to schedule my dentist appointment. I haven't actually been since pandemic started. Actually, I take that back. I had, I did have to go in the middle of one because I chipped a tooth. <laughs> this dude's friggin' awesome. That is a look. <laughs> He's the best. This is pretty great too, just sort of breaking down a teenager not standing still, just constantly wiggling and repositioning. <laughs> if you're lucky, Kelly, he'll be your future husband. <laughs> That's so funny. I had ED, I had that same conversation with my sister where she was like talking about Rube Goldberg machines. And I was like, and I just mentioned that he was a cartoonist, and she was like, What? And this 
drawing. I never noticed this before. This drawing is kind of fucking me up. Like here is my, I mean, can you even see it against? So hard to see a see-through thing. Wait, hold on. Is this one easier to see? No, not really. But here's like my AIMS lettering guide and I have never once used it like that. I've only ever used it like this. That's weird. Cause like this disc is, you can rotate this any way you want. So you could get that same exact angle if you want to. I don't know. I don't know what's going on with that Ames drawing. Yeah, I have a, I'll pull it out maybe for another stream someday, but I have actually a, um, like if you ever look at the old EC comics, the lettering though in those is like really strange and like oddly mechanical. And it was because they used a device that I can't remember what it's called off the top of my head, but it would have the letters in alphabetical order in a little template. And you would put a little needle in those letters and then draw like basically tracing them off to the side um, for your lettering. I don't know if I'm explaining it right. I'll pull it out for another stream and we can look at it. And that's beautiful. Like that is, like that looks like some pogo style lettering. Hey, Morgan. You're not the only one. I almost forgot about streaming until like, I don't even know, like four o'clock this afternoon. I was like, oh no, I got to stream. There's my favorite font of all time, the old Futura. It's such a like, like everyone in graphic design is like Helvetica, Helvetica, Helvetica. And like, you know what? Fuck Helvetica. Futura is beautiful. Don't tell any graphics designers I said that, please. <laughs> Papyrus. I saw a really funny quote from the guy who um, invented Comics Sans, where he was saying, um, he said... If you hate Comic Sans, you don't know anything about font design. If you love Comic Sans, you also don't know anything about font design. Which I thought was a pretty good summary. <laughs> oh, poor Kelly. Actually, I don't think Helvetica is a bad font. I think it's pretty good. I actually... Like, I don't know, for graphic designers, this is probably um, the worst thing I could say, but I think Arial is a little bit better of a font than Helvetica. <laughs> it was so funny about Undertale. I did not, I've never played Undertale, but I remember some of my friends when they realized that all the characters were named after fonts.
<laughs> Avetica may be the spork, but it's like every um, fancy pants person on the planet is like, please bring me a spork because I'm truly classy. Yeah, here's a whole section about Rube Goldberg. It's absolutely amazing that, like, this dude made these comic strips like this. And like, <laughs> like, I don't know. He just did it for a living. Like, that's so awesome. That's the most amazing thing ever. Like, it's just so great when someone can find some weird little thing and just absolutely go bonkers with it. And, um, and everyone else in the world sees it and is like, yes, we are also bonkers for these things. I got to look up New Century Gothic, ED. I don't remember what that looks like. One of these days, too, I'm going to pull out, I think they call it Pebble Board. I have some, there's like a very highly textured paper that they used to get these kinds of gradients. And you just use like a, you know, a black colored pencil or like a, a China marker and draw on this. And it would give you the texture that reproduced really, really well. And I have a pad of it somewhere, if I can find it. Anyway, this was back in the days when um, the idea of an atomic bomb destroying us all was new. I think they might, I think, I think you might be right, Pippi. Stone paper might be another name for it. I think there's a couple different, I think there is a couple different manufacturers and they all sort of had um, their brand name for it. <laughs> it's like, wow, that is some, oh, I can't get it under the camera. That right there is some hard hitting stuff. High prices and higher prices. Ooh. Brutal. Drag them. I guess I did not know that Rube Goldberg did 
political cartoons before um, seeing this stuff. Yeah, ED, One World Destruction actually scared people. I wonder if they had um, editorial cartoons back then that were like, you know, maybe nuclear Armageddon isn't so bad. And this is a strange cartoon. Rivalry in sports and rivalry in hate. Like, I guess they're saying that the Olympics are better than going to war. I mean, if so, I think this cartoonist has gone too far. Although, you know, the cartoonist is about to absolutely end himself like that has not gone too far. All right, here's my guy, Milton Kniff. Man, I really wish that there were more adventure strips in these papers. Like I, actually, I had a a thing where I would I really wish that they like every local newspaper had an adventure strip that was sort of based around local history. Like me being in Oregon, like I wish there was a like an adventure strip about you know like. Um, the sort of the gold rushy days of Oregon, maybe, you know, where there's beaver trappers everywhere and do sort of an adventure detective thing set in that era. And then, I don't know, like if you lived in San Diego, you would do one about maybe during world war two when that place was booming So one of the things about Milton Kniff that I think is like kind of worth thinking about for cartooning is just how he, he was very interested in acting and drama stuff. Um, this is him when he was in college um, playing some role. What is this? The ninth annual production, blah, blah, blah. I don't know. But Milton Kniff played Bonaparte K. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. I think that, uh, like, I did uh, drama in high school, too, and really, really enjoyed it. And I feel like it has helped me with my cartooning a lot. Just thinking about just acting, especially, like, stage acting and trying to um, – make things clear to people across the room when you're acting. I think that really helps with cartooning. <laughs> Actually, Edie, that sounds like a pretty uh, amazing comic strip and it would be dark and no one would well, no one would uh you know want to distribute that but it could be really good
this is like this is the good stuff like this is why these um famous artist cartoon courses are good is like here's actually a pretty in-depth um explanation of milton kniff's production process and i feel like it's probably i don't know maybe 10 or 15 percent of it is bullshit like a lot but i think there's like actual real info here about like this is legit where he actually had a letterer who did the lettering on his strips before he drew them which is absolutely like i think lettering before you've drawn anything is kind of wild like i don't think i would do that but um like i would basically letter after this phase and that's that's kind of how i work right now is i actually do my layouts my rough drawings first and then i letter it and then i do my pencils um, once i know where all my balloons are going to go because lettering is just so critical to how um how you read a page, how you go from panel to panel and having these giant white shapes in every single panel changes your composition a lot. And this is interesting too, where he, he makes it so he draws all the figures in and the props that they're actually touching. And then he's actually using these like drawing backgrounds as backgrounds. Like these guys are like, these drawings are complete. And then it goes back in and adds in environments and then inks them. I think that, um, like that's weird to me, but that's cool. And look at this studio. Can I get it in the camera? Dang. <laughs> like I actually, I have a pretty nice studio set up right now. Um, but I would love to have that, those giant high ceilings and stuff. Al Cap's inking is very interesting to me too. Like I think I think it's really quite beautiful, but very different from Milton Kniff. Like the whole uh, incomplete lines here that sort of indicate are more an indication of light than they are of like contour. It's amazing. I actually did hold on. For the Harrow County board game, um, we included a newspaper and in the newspaper, I did a comic strip for it. That was an Al Cap, um, like a rip off. Uh, instead of little Abner, it was little Stabner.
That was pretty fun. It's like um, trying to draw in another person's style is very difficult. Like these four panels took me all friggin' day. It took me a whole day to do this. Yeah, Mark, this is for the Harrow County Observer Strips. This is one of them. Spoiler. So, I don't know. I don't think I quite nailed the, um, the Al, Al Cap style, but got close enough that it looks recognizable. And I feel like, yeah, like there's no, there's no process stuff in Al Cap's little section. Yeah, which really leads me to believe that um, at this at this stage, Al Cap wasn't drawing any of this stuff. Like these could very well be some Frazetta pages or there was a couple other guys. I don't remember. I don't like, I don't know actually who else was working on it, but um, I know there was sort of a, a handful of people who ghosted all these strips. So Willard Mullen, this dude, like, I don't even know how you would make a living do just focusing on sports cartooning, but um, he did it. Some unfortunate racist stuff. But his, his boxing stuff is like, really incredible. Like, just the anatomy and the motion of these is like, just incredible. I hope I'm not, I hope my constant zooming in and stuff isn't making anybody sick. I think this is great. He even manages to make being an artist super dynamic. That's exactly what I look like when I'm drawing. Yeah, there's some more of that. Pebble texture paper. This is great too. This is something that um, nobody has to use anymore. Uh, is the pantograph where you trace the little picture and it like you got a little pencil or a pen nib over here that 
um, makes it big. Amazing. <laughs> yeah, Pippi. I was thinking that same thing that just looking at this tonight was going to make me a better. Like as soon as I get off the stream tonight, I'm going and uh, I'm actually taking my iPad, sitting on the couch and working for a couple more hours. And looking at this stuff, I'm thinking I'm going to be all jazzed to, to start drawing. <laughs> I don't know what COD is, ED. Unless it's like, instead of a bass fishing game, it's a cod fishing game. Oh, Call of Duty. Yes, of course. <laughs> Man, it's so funny. When I stopped working in video games, like, my, um, I actually just let my video game brain totally just go away. Although I will say I'm super jazzed for um, uh, Call of the Wild to come out. Or not Call of the Wild, whatever the new Zelda game is called. I got it pre-ordered. This is fucking great. I did not even know there was a COD comic. I guess I can just call it a Call of Duty comic. <laughs> This part, I don't think this part ever changes. Doing like cartooning for advertising still is like, uh, you'll make way more money. All right. That's it. Famous artist cartoon course. And these guys did um, famous artist painting course, and they did a famous artist um, illustration course. They did a bunch of these, and they're all actually really good. Some of the best uh, art instruction books I've ever found. And they're just beautiful. I mean, look at look at this package. Like it's just a giant binder. They would put your name on there. Oh, that's so nice. 
I can't tell you how bad I would love to have one of these that said Tyler Crook on it. Oh, hold on a second. Since I'm showing off like cartoonist stuff from this era, I'll just really quick show uh, one of my Abner Dean books. This dude is like one of the weirdest cartoonists and one of my favorites of all time. Like, oh, strangely apt the return to normal accumulated virtue <laughs> very bad memory that's very funny to me so Abner Dean, as I understand, like he did like a lot of regular um, cartoons for sort of like, uh, um, you know, the New Yorker kinds of things. But uh, but this these books were what he sort of considered his real like work. Like this one says gregariousness. And all these people, like little cubes in the background. It's like, they're just beautiful. Like, they're sometimes they're really funny. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes I don't get them at all. Like, I don't actually get this one. It's a long way to heaven. There's a cute face in a little hole. This guy's angry going for a walk going to heaven i presume while this guy is like dreaming of the person in the hole i don't know i don't get it but i love it also these clouds are like beautifully rendered anyway <laughs> this one says optimism <laughs> the understanding wife. It's great. Anyway, that's Abner Dean. He has a bunch of these books. Um, well, a bunch. I think maybe there's like five or six of them. Um, he actually has a book of poetry too that is really good. Yeah, there we go. So I thought this would be my super low effort Um and maybe stream for a half hour, but here we are at an hour and 15 minutes. <sighs> All right. Thanks, Pippi. That was really fun, guys. Thank you so much for coming. Um, thanks for hanging out. Hey, Lars. I'm not going to read you a story. <laughs> Um, have a good weekend, everybody. Tell the people you love that you love them and um, protect trans kids. And I hope everybody has a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Thanks again for coming by and I'll see you next week. Bye.